Today I'm going to talk about four questions. Why we invest into Israel, and how and what we invest into Israel. And what's the challenge facing us, and what's the perspective and the outlook uh, investing into Israel. Actually, as a fund manager, we constantly asking us a very uh, important a million dollar questions. What's the next big things? So in 1998, I left the Deutsche Bank as an investment banker. I started working for Deutsche Bank, managing a venture fund. At that time, we basically we invested into the so-called internet, but actually none of us understand what the internet needs. So basically, we, we throw the money into all the companies with DACA. And by the end of 2004, uh, actually, we luckily uh, we just exited all of these uh, successful holdings, including Citrix, although the 30% to 50% actually is the go bust date. So then in 2004, we started asking us again. So what's the next big thing? So where's the next big thing? So how are we supposed to access to it? So after a painful session of a lot of brainstorming, we come into uh, one big question is, what's the clean tech means? So very quickly, we invest a, a lot of money into the clean tech, including uh, uh, solar power, wind turbine, LED, biomass, and also some of the biomaterials. And uh, luckily, we got, get a couple of uh, home run deals, uh, including Jinko Solar, listed in the New York Stock Exchange. And also, we have uh, Kinsan LED, the largest uh, LED company listed in Shenzhen Stock Exchange. So at that time, I come across a investor who is a co-investor with me in the Jinko Solar. It's called Kitango. Kitango is the, one of the largest uh, Israeli venture firm. So I began to look into what's going to happen to Israel. So actually coming to the point like the year of 2011, so we try to make assessment what's the China economy situation like? What's the China restructuring form coming to, to the point that we need to look at what China need and this. so basically our assessment is that China manufacturing sector is established comparative advantage so in Adam Smith's terminologies and we have a very strong manufacturing supply chains and we have a deep pool of the capital market and we also have the, the one of the biggest consumer market, but we need technologies to make our manufacturing to be improved, upgraded, particularly in, in the respect of automation and also the supply chain management and the smart manufacturing and the better solutions to manage the capital flow, information flow, and the logistics. So. The, the, then we organized a team to do a so-called due diligence or factor funding, if you like, into Israel, US, Germany, Japan, uh, Ireland, Russia. So our conclusion is that uh, Israel is the right market, which is the, can be the right source of the technology suppliers for Chinese manufacturing to upgrade and for improvement. Uh, the reason is Israel have technology, but uh, do not have market capital and also the manufacturing value chance. But China have everything else but the technologies, <laughs> the market capital, value chance. But we desperate for technologies to improve our manufacturing. And secondly, is that Israel have this. Uh, Right technology, including cybersecurity, image, uh, automotive cybersecurity, autonomous driving, uh, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, 
uh, NLP, it's natural language processing, medical devices, data compressing, semiconductor, and the blockchains. Uh, we also found out the right technology from Israel is also compatible and in line with the target sectors. My company, TDR Capital, is built up in the past 10 years. And uh, in the meantime, let's, uh, we look at the, what happened to the Israel. Startup landscape is that, uh, uh, so I, let me back up a little bit. Before 2013, Israel technology basically is uh, doing the so-called American models. That means these startup companies, they basically they come to the point of what we call the BOP, is the business of a prototype. That means they come to the point, have a prototype, they need to commercialize the product. So they, they normally will be migrated to the US market and keep the R&D in, in Israel and build up a marketing team in New York. So that's the so-called American models. So when we are doing our due diligence about the issues, so I think the investment community and the startup community realize that they want to look at the alternative <laughs> on, on top of the American models. That's what we are called the China model. This means they are looking for China to cap capitalize the our deep of the capital and the market and as well as the value chain manufacturing uh, industry. So let's, let, let's, let me now move on to uh, what we invest and how we invest. So investing into Israel is the first important thing is for us to find the right partners. So we, we team up with a, a, a company called the First Time. Uh, we should have an equity relationship with the Time. Time in turn is one of the top national incubator license holders. Then we can have access to the new source of Time, the first time, and because there's uh, over 50 companies operating uh, with, uh, under the umbrella of uh, uh, Time. Then we need to uh, look into the structures. So our structure is so-called double-deck structures. So on the top we lift, we invest into the fund, like time. Actually we buy the ticket and we have trying to have a co-investment right. Then the lower deck is we have exercised our co-investment right in order to invest into the portfolio companies of the fund we invest into it. So basically our methodology is cherry picking and each and every of these portfolio companies trying to pick up these best performers, then we double down the money for the follow-on finances. So the double down one normally be taking place starting from series A all the way to the series C. Because after the series C, the American venture firm will be coming in with the big checks. So we let them carry on the fund and starting from the series C. So that's our strategy. Back to China, we also struck a strategic relationship with the three domestic incubator, accelerator, to accommodate the Israeli companies we put the money into, uh, which potentially will migrate into the China market. So in other words, if any Israeli company is going to move into China to go to the market, so-called, so we basically will be using our infrastructure with the incubator and the accelerator domestically trying to help Israeli companies to build up the marketing team and in the meantime we're trying to redevelop the products to customize the Chinese market. And we're also trying to build up a pool of the leader of certain industries and to help 
to cooperate with the Israeli companies to immigrate to China market, particularly in the medical devices sectors, because like Mary, you know, it's the largest medical uh, devices companies. They have uh, engineers like two thousand people. So for every average. <coughs> Uh, Israeli uh, startup company actually basically maximum have five engineers, so that will be help a lot when they talk about uh, go to market in China. So, so we invest. Currently, we have a holding like uh, twenty companies. The uh, one fund we invest invest into Israel's, and uh, I'm not going to go through the each and every of these companies. <coughs> But I am going to give you some, uh, you know, uh, some feels about uh, what sort of company we invest in too. And I, I just give you uh, some uh, three companies. So first uh, company I'm talking about is Pixelot. Pixelot is a uh, multi-camera system uh, in a single fixed lab, covering the entire field of uh, uh, the sports recovery and delivery in staged panoramic image. So basically that's a technology, it's an auto production <coughs> algorithm. And uh, our business model actually is the interactive content with the resolution of uh, uh, for uh, web, mobile, uh, virtual reality application, and to allow the user to have a tool to generate and share their own clips. In other words, that's a, basically the user can, can can do all the coverage, and in the meantime, they can recreate all the contents to share with the other users. So Pixelart currently is a, is a leader in automated production, sports production. We sold 2,000 system worldwide. Second company we call is Playbox. Uh, anybody heard about about the bus fee? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we basically it's a, it's a similar model with the bus fee. Uh, we are the series competitor to bus fee. We have currently we have active user like two hundred million people. Uh, so our business model is an online publishing platform, and uh, we basically is providing a platform to. Uh, for the public grant agencies and the all type of content creators with the format of the post, uh, quiz, the listings, videos, snippet, and the size source. So the content generate, generated from the playbox is one of the most uh, uh, shared content on uh, Facebook and also other social media. So because Playbus, we use the interactive storytelling and the uh, real-time uh, analytic tools to encourage and boost their reach and reach the brand awareness and improve the monetization capabilities and optimize the content for maximum social inter interactions. In other words, so the, the Playbus, we have a different uh, business model compared with the bus the bus feed, the bus feed basically is a social media. We are technology companies trying to provide the tool for the users. So we are trying to create the new medium, internet language, to re-establish the traditional and uh, conventional publishers to have a wider spread. So the third company I'm talking about is a, a talk space. Talkspace is one of the top ten, the top five uh, online therapy companies in the U.S. Currently, it's just a move from uh, the television to New York. So it's a landline and a mobile platform to collect the user with the licensed therapist. Currently, we have uh, 300 licensed therapists. We have constantly we have an active user like uh, 2,000. So technology behind this is a matching algorithm. Our business model is data-driven. So 
Foxbase is the first to apply the feedback informed treatment, and also we are the first one in the real time therapy with the data platform. So the key strength of Foxbase actually is the data. We basically they're using the data, trying to source and to match with the the, the patient and the users. And uh, this one is uh, over the last uh, two years, the talk space experience is explosive growth. And because it's easier, it's, it's less expensive, it's easy access, and most importantly, to avoid the sense of the stigmatizations. So, now I'm moving on to talk about the challenge about investing into Israel's. So, Israel is a country of innovations, as everybody knows. And, uh, but the number-wise, uh, let me give you a couple of numbers, probably you may have an even more concrete image. Israel is 25% uh, of the GDP, and 47% of the export is coming from technologies. Israel is a small country, the population is 80 million, GDP is 300 billion, it's more or less like Shenzhen or Hong Kong or South Korea or Taiwan, more or less the size. Uh, however, Israel is in many ways ranked number one in the world uh, in terms of uh, R&D expenditure over GDP. Israel is ranked number one in the world with 4.4% over 4.6%. 4.06 US, 2.1 China. Israel is also number one in terms of the R&D expenditure per capita. It's 1,357, it's also it's number one in the world. And uh, another indicator is the number of the scientists and engineers per 10,000 people. It's 135, US it is 85. China is will be largely less because we have a very large population. So everything per capita will be very, very far behind. Sorry about that. <laughs> so we also run the number three in the world, Israel, in terms of the number of the company in the NASDAQ is 178. Now it's probably by today is over 200. And now Israel is uh, actually is also a country inventing a lot of technologies in the history. <coughs> USB and uh, Pentium processor is coming from Intel. Intel actually is maintaining the large engineers, largest engineer working force in Israel in the Haifa. I believe they are like 20,000 people on there. Uh, so most of the Intel's of the invention actually is coming out of Haifa. Digital printing, core rotor, CRIs, uh, ICQ. ICQ is the instant uh, messaging technology. Tension actually is the using the technology, uh, the instant messaging technology back in 10 years ago coming out from Israel. IPU voice call. The the motion sensing, this is a very cool technology. It's, it's developed and maintained by the premises. Lossless compression, data compression is a very big thing. Uh, drip, uh, irrigation, and also the Israeli bandage. Currently, there are uh, at least 12 industries. Israel still maintains the advantage over this cutting edge technology in the set as following motion sensing, machine learning, navigation technology, uh, blockchain. Wave. Wave is a very good company, actually, is doing the blockchain for the supply chain management company. Uh, big data, cybersecurity, communication technology, fintech, medical devices, automotive cybersecurity. So why is Israel, like such a small country, become the world, the country of innovations? 
that is the leading advantage over a lot of peers countries. I think that uh, our conclusion is the startup and the technology innovation ecosystem in Israel is very unique. There's a military, government, multinational, multinational enterprises, VC, including local and international, and the university. Unique in the way that Israel innovation ecosystem is different from the Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley basically is driven by the Stanford University engineers and the VC firm. Of course, the initial is if you talk about the back 20 years ago, it's also the uh, American governments have laws to, to fast speed the depletion of uh, small technology company, if you will. So, <coughs> The uniqueness of this uh, ecosystem is coming from three things. One, the government. The Israeli government actually is, can match up like a six to one investment together with the private sectors. In other words, if you just go into the startup in Israel, so if you put up one million dollars, and Israeli government can put up six million dollars, to match the private sector investment. Of course, you have to go through the procedures to get the approval from the first scientist office, which is basically just a screening, vetting all, all these applications. And the most important, if you are just being successful, the government only recruit and get the principal back of plus interest. They are not going to the shared upside with them private sector. Uh, if you feel the government is never going to bother you, <clears throat> even you coming back to apply the second time, the government is still likely to put up an investment for you if the technology is very cool. Second thing is about the military. Uh, so anybody heard about the unit 8200? 8200 is an uh, Israeli intelligence corps unit responsible for collecting signal intelligence and to code decryp decryptions. The unit actually recruit all these young boys, girls, in the age of 18 years to 20 years old with the ability of rapid adaption and the speedy learning. In other words, they basically like to recruit the young boys, know nothing. They are trying to train these boys and girls to, to very quickly get into a situation to catch up. That's a very unique aspect of uh, 82,000. One of our partners, and we, we've been working with 82,000 alumni many, many times. And the reason I'm talking about 82,000 is because 82,000 become the engine of the Israeli innovations. It's the main drivers for the startup and for the investment communities, for the serious entrepreneurs. Uh, the uh, 82,000 alumni actually is behind many, many cool technology companies the many, many startup. Let me give you some examples of uh, technology companies uh, start jump starting by uh, 82,000 alumni. Uh, Checkpoint. So, when you know Checkpoint, right? Checkpoint is the largest cyber security in the world. With the market type like 10 billion US dollars listed in New York Stock Exchange. They are doing everything, all kinds of cyber securities, multi devices, and the multi access uh, is the absolute leader in the cyber security industry. Second company is a nice system, now it's called a nice, they just change the name because they really want to transfer from average software company into an enterprise software. Uh, currently, it's listed in New York Stock Exchange with a market cap. $60 billion, just within a 10 years' time. And another one is, is a 
And Byron is also a software company with a market cap of 2.7 billion. All these cool companies have invented a startup by uh, 8,200 uh, 8, alumni. Uh, the multinational company, almost all these big name tech companies, including Google, Apple, Microsoft, everybody set up their R&D accelerator, particularly in Israel's. That's really, initially, they just trying to recruit the local talent to develop their product. But uh, in the end of the day, actually, all these uh, accelerators run by the international companies provide uh, the talent, the backing to the startup the community in Israel. And for the VC, VC, I think the back angel investor and the local VC are basically investing into any startup uh, in the C and, uh, uh, and until the C and the C after C round, the American big check will become around. That's a very good uh, ecosystem uh, because you know this will be encourage the local VC and the local incubators trying to create the startup. Uh, Technet is uh, is uh, at the Israeli uh, universities basically it's a very innovative, a very dynamic, and. Uh, I think the Columbia has also learned a lot from the Technia, and I visit the Columbia Technology Venture. Uh, so Technia basically the, uh, they set up a system allowed the university, university professor to register their patent and to uh, allow the patent center to uh, uh, team up with the VC firm to commercialize their, their patents and they have a very good system to share the 50-50. That's a very good incentive. So, Israel is a nation of innovation, but why is that this technology is, uh, is being become the leader in the world? The fundum fundamentally, we found out that uh, uh, national survival is one of the fundamental drivers. For that, as you know, uh, Israel is, is uh, surrounded by a lot of the hostile countries. And also the glory of uh, uh, entrepreneurship and the national hero is, is normally is not a rock star or music or the singers. Uh, as the, this entrepreneur actually is a particular for these zero entrepreneurs in our uh, terminologies. This means it's successfully having a more than two uh, Startup and the exit and the, and the X times their cash. So that's a national hero. So that's a very important uh, the element actually. So the challenge challenge we are facing now in the Israel investment uh, the, on the top of the agenda actually is the IP protections. Uh, when we are investing into the Israel technology companies uh, or we just trying to bring them Israel company into China. Uh, I think the Israel <coughs> entrepreneur basically is very concerned about the IP. Uh, how because uh, except the IP, we don't have anything else. Uh, so the trying to figure out what's the proper way the legal structures to pr protect the IP. Second challenge actually is the uh, redevelopment. Or set, we call the second development of the product. Uh, in many cases, the technology uh, developed the Israeli company uh, will need to redevelop to customize the China market, and uh, that's uh, will be take a longer time. Uh, but the uh, Israel technology companies, basically, the shareholder is very short term. They just really want to cash out and walk away. You don't have a lot of patience with the city and the board to, for, the, for the long term. But the Chinese market actually is also the Chinese partners need uh, you know, some time to develop the market and are trying to commercialize. So different from American models. So the Chinese model, they need a lot of the uh, discussion, negotiations, the communications. That's the typical way of Chinese people to doing the business. Uh, and also the legal structure and the culture and the language. 
this is another barrier compared with the American model. It's much easier for the Israeli company to, to migrate to the US. So the solution, the solution for the for this uh, the challenge we are facing, uh, actually uh, we work a lot is the key is to trying to, to look for the right Chinese partners. Who is the right Chinese partners? Who got the very good sense of the IP protections? So we found out that the leading companies in a certain industry and the least companies, and uh, normally they have very spread, uh, good sense of the IP protections. They have a strong uh, sense of the credibilities. So, and also, all these leaders in the certain industries, they have a very big, uh, strong team for the development. They have a large pool of engineers for the redevelopment of this uh, product and technology coming from Israel. On the other hand, the Chinese partners are also very sensitive to the data sharing and also they are very anxious to find out whether this Israel technology is really uh, applicable to the China market and how long and whether the Chinese can really develop the, the technology itself. So for instance, we invest into a bond for the companies doing the data and also the uh, natural language processing technologies. We bring them over to China, talking to all these big players, including Tencent. And, uh, but uh, we, we just feel that because it takes a lot of time for us to convince the Tencent to see whether this is a uh, technology can be a uh, very quickly to apply to the China market and also, most importantly, all these major giant technology companies in China uh, don't want to share the data. So there's another challenge. So let me uh, move on to the last point for the outlook and the prospect. Uh, so technology. So what's the good technology we are looking at currently? My firm and uh, some of my um, colleagues and some of the, the financial investors, uh, five technologies we are currently focused on and then taking a very close look uh, in Israel uh, startup, uh, startup communities. Semiconductors. For obvious reasons, everybody knows that it's a Department, commercial department in the U.S. We heard yesterday and today as we have a big sanction on the two, the two top telecom uh, equipment vendor in China, Huawei and Zhongxin. That's a huge. You know why? Because you know the major chip supplier currently for the major Chinese telecom companies is coming from the U.S. It's a big, big thing. So, second is uh, technology we're looking at uh, blockchain. Blockchain is very hot. Everybody talk about um, Bitcoin, blockchain, and uh, but uh, we don't think that blockchain is uh, going to apply to the financial sectors, including bank and insurance, particularly in China market, I don't know U.S., because of the regulation, and the central banks, the surveillance and oversight. We think the big application of uh, blockchain technology will be start with the supply chain management. I think IBM is also uh, in the same page with us. Cybersecurity is a big thing for, for in the future um, for two reasons. One is uh, autonomous driving. Uh, is uh, I think that's uh, uh, the the current technology issue is the cyber, is the securities and a lot of the time you know we been visiting all these uh, cybersecurity company in Israel we have a very good pool of the people's hackers keep on hacking all these hacking all these uh, uh, 
driver is cars, and trying to figure out what's the best protection for that. That's a big issue. That's the reason why the mobile eyes are sold to, to Intel with a uh, very big price tag, 15 billion US dollars. So the data compression is also another technology we are looking at on the medical devices. This is the five technology we currently very much focus on and we are working on. Uh, So the for Israel technology company, I think the two model, American model and the US model, will coexist in the futures, side by side. Uh, because the US model is very safe, it's tested. The China model is still in the process. And another thing is that the China central regulatory used to tighten up the capital control and the capital flow that's the reason that over the last two years there's a, there's a few money just being flowing into the Israeli market. Uh, but I, we believe that you know, the, the grip, the control and the capital flow will be loosened up in the coming two, two or three years time. Uh, so let me give you some ideas about uh, how many Chinese organizations and invest into Israel, so what kind of type of the investment they are made. Currently, we have a three types of Chinese investment into Israel. One is strategic acquisitions led by the industry players. So second type is the financial investor like us, and also the technology companies set up R&D centers. So giant interactive group, they paid 4.4 billion and took over Kletika. It's the largest mobile gaming company in Israel. The Sandal Camp Group paid 1.4 billion to took over IBA. And also the, the Bright Food Group uh, is took over Unuwa. So Xiaomi and uh, Baidu and the Lenovo and the Ali and the Huawei it also made the investment into Israel. Huawei set up R&D in, uh, in Israel to develop the Targa network in 2011, and Tsinghua University also set up a, a lab at Tel Aviv University. We believe that the uh, investment of Chinese company into Israel will continue to be on rise in the coming five years time. The IP protect, protections, I want to talk a little bit about, about that. Uh, I think China realized the IP protection is become a big issue going forward. And uh, so this year, in 2018 March, uh, Chinese government reorganized them and established the national IP protection bureaus incorporate the various the government agents are trying to give up all these uh, IP protections. China just made a tremendous effort trying to improve the IP protections. I think the, uh, quite a, some of the progress is made in the, over the last uh, uh, 10 years. The most importantly, China actually is uh, starting from 2017. Uh, we, we just uh, uh, become a patent generators and uh, instead of the major user of the patent. In 2017, we, China filed a patent in, in the range of uh, 48,000. It's become the number two in the world. And U.S. is number one, is 55. Japan is number three, is 45,000. This is very important because China become the patent generators. So we also trying to seek protections for the Chinese patent. The over the last the, ten years ago, we are basically the user of the patent. 
patent. So we will be bleeding and charged with, the, you know, you are stealing the patent from other countries. You know, but now we need the protection for our patent. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous <coughs> for the patent. I want to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, 200 years ago, in 19 centuries, the U.S. is the biggest thief of the IP because they are stealing almost everything from the U.K. And if you are like Charles Dickens, you know, the, in the royalties, you know, his IP is basically stolen in America. Then, the bank coming into the 20th century, the, you know, the Japan come to be charged and blamed with the stealing, stealing the IPs and the Korea and Taiwan, etc. Then the China. I mean, it's a technology is the universal asset. It's supposed to be shared by the human beings. I mean, it's a Israeli technology, U.S. technology, Chinese technology. It's just supposed to be a benefit of human beings. So treatable. Uh, so the question is, the trade war is going to be a big barrier for the uh, economic relationship between China and Israel, and our investment into Israel. So the trade war is, uh, we're just trying to figure out the, whether or not the, the trade war the possible scenarios. There's two possible scenarios for the for the trade war between China and the U.S. You know, one is uh, uh, you know the block in the back and the force and the compromise come to the table and then the hammer out the deal. Secondly, is uh, all out of war to the extreme, and that means uh, you know both sides will be in the, the impose the tariff to many products, import and export. And the thirdly is the long term, um, the war of the dragon is the so called trade frictions, and the fight and the, and the negotiation, and like uh, what happened 20 years ago, the US and the Japan trade war lasted for, for a long, long, long time. So it's coming to the point that they really uh, to hammer out the deal, to mutually accept it to both sides. So, well, so we think that. China-U.S. trade frictions are, will be very long-term phenomena. It's not going to end up very quick solutions. Uh, I mean, it's a you know, Trump. I don't think he understands international trade. He think uh, export is good, import is bad. I mean, it's a trade is very complicated issues. Yes. Yes. And uh, so we think that. Uh, the same U.S. trade war and the, uh, the frictions is not going to have a major impact on our investment in Israel, but the same the China-U.S. relationship and the U.S.-Israel relationship <coughs> will be have an impact on the China-Israel relationship, and uh, because as you know, uh, U.S. is the most important uh, diplomatic relationship partners. For Israel, uh, but I mean, that's my personal experience. Chinese and the Jews, when we come into the tables, you know, the the most savvy, crude, and the smartest human beings, we can have figured out and work it out very quickly. <laughs> and so this is another reason why I'm just being, you know, I, I like to invest in Israel. Everything is so familiar. I mean, it's, it's very comfortable to use. So I'm not worried worry about that at all. <clears throat> Investment in Israel, actually, is, we also have a downside. There's a still have a risk. And I'm not going to specify what kind of risk, etc. Um, but we believe that uh, our investment into Israel is still in the early stage. It's a still kind of the experimental investment for us, um, but we are very confident to carry on this investment. And uh, TDR Capital, my firm, and myself, I still believe that uh, we, uh, our major investment market is still uh, China. China is uh, still uh, the best market for us to, to look at. 
and uh, we will be still continue to focus uh, on China. Uh, currently, our investment to Israel is only accounting for like uh, below 10 percent, and the down road probably will be increased up. But I, I think that once again, uh, our focus is still in China, and uh, and my firm and myself is uh, in the past and now in the future. We are unreasonably and blindly often in mistake about uh, China and the uh, investment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ramos, share, for sharing our insights. So, uh, we understand that it might be a, a little bit late for uh, many of you, so, like, uh, you may feel free to uh, take off if it's uh, a little bit too late for you, but we will have time for three or five questions, so how, how many would you like to take? So maybe, can, how about uh, five questions? So, uh, my friend the band probably will get five, five questions. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wall, thank you very much, that was very informative. Um, Hello, I'm Mike Patrick Sheehan, I'm the director of the Pure Sheehan Diabetes Care Foundation. We work around accelerators in healthcare and medical technologies. What did, what is your impression on how China's Belt and Road Initiative will affect um, what you consider to be a market for redevelopment when, ex when investing through Israeli technologies, um, seeking to export them to foreign markets? Uh, I think the 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 redevelopment, the second, de the second development of Israel technology is very important to come into the China market. Uh, I think the complementary between Israel and China is that we normally, for the leader in a certain industry, particularly in the medical devices, we have a large pool of uh, uh, engineers. They understand the China market, they, they know all these developments, and most importantly, they also have experience of uh, uh, support, the sales and the marketing of the product uh, in, in, in China. So in that sense, uh, China is even in better position compared with the U.S. market. If you are talking about Israeli technology, migrate into the larger consumer market. That's, uh, so. So I think it's, uh, thank you very much for your answer. I advise you to look into 8400, which is a new organization in Israel, modeled off 8200 for healthcare and medical technologies. Okay, okay, thank you. I will look into it, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Um, my name is Yu Shi Li, I'm a club uh, company alumni. Thanks very much for your presentation today. Um, my question is very actually practical. Um, so two years ago I founded a company with two with other um, partners, including a Israeli partner. We did a cross-border uh, fundraising and investment in Israel and the US. So my Israeli partner actually travels between Israel and the U.S. And his company in Israel actually is a majority stakeholder of several companies, including uh, the largest IP platform, SN2E, which has a first look of all the IPs from university, military, and hospitals. And the accelerator and incubators of the Homeland Security. So basically, we look, we focus at the cybersecurity, healthcare, um, uh, technologies in Israel. Um, as a Chinese, I'm working with him to explore the opportunities and the partnerships uh, with China to uh, on the IP commercialization. Could we get into the question? Yes, I was just giving the background of the question I'm going to ask. So I have talked with some partners in China on the IP commercialization, including the incubators, government, the BAT, James technology firms in China, but we just didn't work out the way to do to commercialize the IPs. So my question actually is, you talk about the partners in China, you talk about how important to find the partners in both the China and the, the Israel. 
So my headache actually is how to find the right partners in China. As a Chinese, I cannot find the right partners. I talk with so many people. I talk with the government. Uh, I talk with the optics value of China. Um, I talk with the Tencent as well. We just didn't figure out. So could you please um, give some advice of looking for the right partners in China, um, especially on the IP commercialization? Thank you. That's a very uh, challenging question. <laughs> uh, IP commercializations. I think 20 years ago, I was working with the, the biggest pool of IP companies in US. You know, the the actually is general generate half million uh, IPs worldwide, and we are trying to cooperate with them and to bring all these IPs into the Asian market broadly, rather than in addition to China. So my experience is probably you should try, you know, is to uh, to set up a partnership with the uh, incubators in China. Uh, this is, a, you know, incubator in the way that uh, uh, you have an engineering team and also marketing team to understand the IP and the product uh, and trying to uh, develop that product into, to the point it's the prototype and uh, should it be available. The second way of doing this is uh, uh, team up with uh, uh, certain industry leaders <coughs> in the certain industry. Uh, I think that if you approach uh, uh, Tencent or Ali or Baidu, we be, you know, we basically will be, uh, uh, they have a lot of concerns about the, the data sharing as I suppose. And uh, they don't want to open up the data. So the data is, uh, you know, uh, is the key concern for them. And then also, they have the capacities to develop their own technologies. So I, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's also it's a tough call. Uh, but I, I don't know, I, have, I don't have a very good answer for your questions. <laughs> Just general question. Uh, just general question. Uh, we know that Trump moved the embassy to what? Uh, Jerusalem. So, just general opinion. You know, your geopolitical potential worry there. Uh, you know, in the region. Uh, that's number one. Number two uh, is China. Has one belt, one row uh, initiative, uh, possibly intertwined with the geopolitical. What, what do you think, general? Just general idea. Thank you. I, I'm not a politician. So I'm a bit <laughs> I'm very practical. I, I really want to make a lot of money for my my LP, for my investors. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's a risk. So as a professional investor, we always live with the risk. And there's two types of risk. One is a systemic risk. This is totally out of control. And there's an unsystemic risk. It's called the intrinsic uh, uh, risk, which we can control. And we try to spot the risk. As an investor, we only take on the calculated risk. And uh, uh, obviously, the geopolitical Risk is one of these uh, systemic risk. That's something we have to take on. Um, but I mean, I'm very uh, optimistic about uh, Chinese government. It's uh, in a better position and smart enough to figure out the best way for, for the country and for our economy. Uh, I don't worry about that. Just as a follow-up question on this, you mentioned that you don't think the political situation would be uh, interrupting the commercial relations, but you think in the future, as the 
commercial interest increase, China will consider to get a more active role in political issues in the region to increase the risk, which is not necessarily systematic. <laughs> I may in the position to answer these questions. <laughs> so, uh, uh, just your personal. Okay, okay. Uh, let me go back to Israel. So Israel is the first Middle East country to recognize the People's Republic of China in, back in 1951. Israel is founded as a country in 1948 because this is a very busy period of time for the founder of the country. They are busy with the many, many things, but it is still recognized us as a, as a, as a country and the formal diplomatic relationship between the country is officially established in 1992. So the two countries is very in very good form in in the political uh, levels and in the people in the street. Ever you know because the historical relationship between um, the, the Jews and the Chinese, as you know, there's a three wave of. Uh, uh, Jewish people is an immigrant to China in the Sun Dynasty, it's a, you know, 900 years ago. And, and uh, during the Second World War, we, we have uh, like 50,000 Jews that is coming to Shanghai. And uh, China is one of the visa free country to uh, come to accept the, the, the Jews. Uh, so, the reason I'm talking about a little bit of history is that. Uh, for the one belt, one road, Israel is the, at the point of the one belt, one, belt, one, one road. Israel is also in the 2015 joined the China Infrastructure Bank. This is a big thing for us. It's very friendly, it's, uh, it's very welcome, and uh, I, I think that uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm not a politician, so I cannot make a very concrete comments of what happens is going to be uh, politically, but we as a professional investors, we discounted all the political factors into our models. And if you are interested, I can talk to you, uh, you know, up, after this and uh, about our models. Thank you. Thank you for the journey today. It's really exciting. So basically, from the fundamental of your business model is like the cooperation between Israel technology and Chinese market and capitals. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, my question is: Do you con consider consider the very special relation between Israel and the U.S.? So the trade war, do you consider it as a like opportunity or challenge? in those kind of cooperation? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you. It's a trade war. It's a challenge, but I view it as an opportunity as well. The trade war will be escalating into investment, into the financials. So for every trade war, if you are a student of history, you will find out Financial technology actually is the fundamental underlying factors you know, below the surface. So, U.S. is realized Chinese technology is catching up very quickly, and uh, you know the you know this in the certain industries the Chinese have a advantage. And uh, that's it's already happened. It's going to happen more. Uh, but the trade war itself will be push China to looking for trade opportunity, investment opportunity, and the supplier of technology uh, to other alternative source, uh, including European <coughs> market, including Israel. Uh, that's the reason why we are. Uh, focus on looking at all these major technology areas, particularly for the semiconductors. And I think that's, that's a big, big issue, very big thing for, 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 for China. Hopefully we can do something and trying to contribute to China technology rise. Thank you. Thank you.
I don't know whether I just uh, yeah. answer your question. Thank you. Mr. Wong, I would like to thank you once again for coming. Oh, is this working? Yes. Um, I'd like to thank you once again. Uh, we'll just switch. I can do it without a microphone. So I'd like to thank you once again for coming and being our last event of the year. As an Israeli who's been um, studying Chinese for the past decade, moving to China next year, um, this is a great way to summarize all of what we've done this year. Um, we're trying to highlight the, the Sino-Israeli connection by I mean, through different alleys, one of which is the private business sector. So thank you very much for your talk. I highly appreciate it. Um, I hope all of you signed up. Um, what we do here is we do try to highlight the different uh, arenas and layers of connection between the Chinese and the Israeli people, the Jews of course. Um, this, we do this by holding lecture events, we do this by bonding events with other clubs on Colombia, and we also do this by sending Israeli, Jewish and Chinese students to intern abroad for a summer. So this summer we're sending 25 students in total. Um, some will be interning in Tel Aviv, others Chinese students, others will be interning in Beijing, Shanghai and Shenzhen. Um, and I, I hope you keep up with us and you enjoy. This was a great year for me. Um, I'd like to thank you once again and uh, yes.